First up tonight is a Devon-based entrepreneur. <sighs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Siobhan Miller. I am a mum to three boys. I'm a fan of When it comes to business, resting on her laurels is not part of Siobhan's vocabulary. Thank you. It's definitely not been easy. I've made a lot of sacrifices, mainly sleep, <laughs> social time, time with my family. For many years, it's just been myself working day and night to, to make the business what it is today. Make your birth better. We were just talking about this over lunch. Were we? We were. I think you just stepped out for a Did moment. I just go completely <laughs> glazed. <laughs> Will the entrepreneur's pitch hold the dragon's attention more than Sarah's lunchtime table talk? Hi, dragons. I'm Siobhan Miller. I'm the founder of the Positive Birth Company. I'm a mum of three and I am on a mission to make antenatal and postnatal education and support more accessible for everyone. Better education and better support reduces the risk of intervention, reduces the risk of postnatal depression, and saves the NHS money. I started teaching hypnobirthing in 2016, and it's fair to say I've worked tirelessly ever since alongside raising my children to grow the business to what it is today. Alongside offering group classes and private one-to-one -one coaching, we are home to the multi-award winning digital pack, the world's most affordable, accessible and fully comprehensive online hypnobirthing program. And we're the creators of Freya, the world's first hypnobirthing friendly virtual birth partner app. Freya will coach you through every single contraction that you experience with a simple breathing technique and help you to relax in between with a mix of positive affirmations and calming visualizations. In the last year, our turnover has been in excess of one million pounds with a gross profit of over 95% and a net profit of approximately 75%. I'm here today to ask for an investment of £136,000 in exchange for 1% equity in the business. Thank you. Hypnobirthing courses and support is the prospect on offer from Siobhan Miller. She's asking for £136,000 in exchange for just 1% of her company. Sarah Davies is first to examine the business opportunity. Hi, I'm Sarah. Hi, Sarah. So I'm really keen to know a little bit more about, you know, a million turnover is a pretty impressive place to get the business to. What's that journey been? How long have you been working towards this? I suppose it started, I became a mum when I was 21, but my birth was really traumatic. So that sort of left me with um, a lot of postnatal anxiety. So then seven years later, when I was pregnant with my second son, I discovered hypnobirthing and it just changed everything for me. I went on to give birth at home on the sofa and I felt like an absolute hero. And wow. I just thought, this is what I want to do. I want every woman to feel like this. And then in 2017, I made a whole series of free videos. I put those up on YouTube. They've been watched hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times. Um, then I went on to develop the online course, which we launched in March 2018. And it yeah, really quickly took off. So last year, your turnover was a million. And so do you still own 100% of the company? I do, yes. Well, honestly, you've blown me away. That, that's super impressive. Thank you. Soaring sales for a relatively infant business have clearly impressed Zara Davies. And it looks like Tej Lalvani is in harmony with the entrepreneur. You probably know that uh, pregnancy health is a specialist area of interest for me. Um, so it all sounds interesting, and I'd love to understand how you make money. Um, so the app is two ninety nine. Currently, we have around six thousand people download every single month, but okay. the app only represents nine percent of our revenue. The majority of it, seventy six percent of our sales mix, is from the digital pack. And how much do you sell that course? For? Thirty nine pounds. It gives you a year's access to the course. So look, the the digital pack sounds interesting, but the other thing that's definitely caught my interest is your valuation. Yes. It's over thirteen million pounds. Thirteen point six million. I know your eyebrows will be raised. They are but, definitely being raised. Yeah. So how did you get to that valuation? Well, you'll be pleased that it wasn't me that carried out the sums. <laughs> I have an accountant, and it was a team of accountants worked on the valuation over several weeks. And what they've done is work it down to the net profit, what will be left in the bank for the next five years, and extending for the timeline of the business. Yeah. 
So I think this is where businesses probably make quite a big mistake when they use advisors. It's not just about the financial results of that business. They've forgotten about the very thing that's the most important. You are the business. If you're not there anymore, the company's gone. Right. So what happens? Hopefully I don't go anywhere. <laughs> No, no, no. Hopefully but you're... nothing happens to me. No, and I I've absolutely hope nothing happens, but you take you out of this business, there's nothing left because you have no ownership structure, you have nothing in place. Oh, you mean like I'm not replaceable in the business? Well, you're not. You've generated all of this. So, sadly, if something happens to yeah. you, this business is in dire straits. Siobhan is snapped back to reality as Peter Jones expresses concern over the viability of her venture's valuation. But Deborah Meaden has some positive affirmations that may restore the entrepreneur's sense of serenity. I love it when somebody just does the thing that they want to do well, and as the outcome of that, you make money. I love my job. Like, I literally love my I job. I can see. It's not my thing. No. I haven't even got children. Yeah. You know, so it feels a little not authentic... Yeah. ..for me to get involved in a business that is deeply authentic. You know, it would feel like I was just, just doing it for the money. It would almost detract from the, the thing that I think you are trying to achieve. So I, I won't be vesting. I'm out. Deborah Meaden feels her participation would prevent the project from being the real McCoy and stands down from the deal. And it seems that Peter Jones has also made up his mind. I have an issue with the business in terms of the valuation. You've come in so high, like the highest valuation we've probably ever had in the den. I'm not over the line with it. OK. So, sadly, I'm going to say I'm out. You know, I, when I was pregnant, I, I bought a hypnobirthing book. Oh, yeah? And, and I, I loved the thought of it. And then I was high risk with both my pregnancies. And so I had to go onto a high dependency ward and go through a controlled labour. And, and I always resented those people who got to do the thing that I wanted to do that yeah. I kind of had taken away from me. So I've always shut out this whole hypnobirthing thing. OK. Um, however, you are brilliant. So for all I decided right at the beginning, yeah. this was for those airy fairy people and You're not, not alone in thinking that. You know, so many people write off hypnobirthing because they mm -hmm. think it's for hippies and that, and they think <laughs> it's just for those people giving birth at home. Mm -hmm. you know? The skill you need to learn is when somebody's on a positive roll and everything's just let me go. going really, Sorry. really well, <laughs> I would let it roll. Sorry. Um, Sorry. For all the reasons I explained, Sorry. I'd like to make you an offer. Oh, thank you. So I will offer you all of the money for 7%. Thank you. At last, an offer from a dragon, albeit at seven times the equity Siobhan was hoping to give away. Tejal Alvani already has a hand in the antenatal arena. Will he be interested in a potential partnership with the positive birthing guru? So, look, I think, you know, you've done very well. In terms of where I'm coming from, I think there are a lot of synergies, and it just sits exactly where, where I am in terms of my business. So, I'm going to make you an offer. Um, I'm going to offer all of the money, but I'd want 10% of your business. Siobhan, um, you know I'm in the baby business. Yes. Um, I'm looking at this and saying, well, if I, if I were to invest, what could I bring to the party? Yeah. Retailers, tick. Product development, tick. I tick all the boxes. I think... I, I, I would give you all of the money. God, God it's happening. You're going to cry. <laughs> you, you know I feel what, a bit emotional. You, you, know, you know what I want yet. It's definitely not 1%. I can't believe this happening. You know? Um, I would give you all of the money, but I want 10%. Okay. And if Tej wanted to share, I would be interested. 
I, I'm open to sharing with Tuka. He does add a lot of value in other areas and we've got uh, investments in, in the baby space as well together. A deal is within touching distance for Siobhan as baby business bigwigs Tej Lalvani and Tuka Suleiman combine with an offer of 10% split between them. Siobhan, I think the time is to go and practice those hypnobirthing breathing techniques at the back of the den. I'll, I'll do just that. Thank you. Also on the table is a more competitive ask of 7% from Sarah Davies. However, both bids are way wide of the 1% Siobhan originally presented. Will the hypnobirth expert be able to stay calm and focus on brokering a better deal? I mean, thank you like, for, for the offers, obviously. 10% or even 7%, but 10%, um, that's very steep um, amount of equity for the value of the business. Um, so I wondered if there was a room for negotiation there on that. Um, what I might be prepared to do is if I got my money back in 18 months, drop the equity down to 7%, provided Tuka is willing to drop as well. Well, well I, I, I would match that. So it's 5% each, falling down to 3.5% each when we get our money back. This is difficult. Would you do the falling instead of 3.5%, 3% each, so that it would be ending up owning 6% of the business? Um, I'll say yes. Yes, yeah, smile. Um, yes, I'll agree to that. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. Like, I know you'd be a massive asset, but I think I'll go with Taj and 2K. That's a yes. Great. Excellent. Thank you. A win for Siobhan, but there's still one small matter to clear up. Just to let you know, your business partners are Tej and Tuka. Sorry, <laughs> what am I saying? Taj, Taj, Taj and hey. Tuka. <laughs> I'm really sorry. And with that resolved, the entrepreneur leaves the den with two well-connected dragons for the price of one. Oh my God, I can't believe it. To come out with Tej and Tuka, who both have experience in the industry, it's beyond what I was dreaming, so it's, yeah, it's amazing. This is all about Taj and Tuke. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, my name's Glenn, pleased to meet you. I'm the Managing Director of Oak & Clough Buildings. I've come here today looking for a minimum investment of £250,000 for at least a 30% stake in a new business that we are creating called Camping Bugs. The Camping Bug concept is simple. We design, we manufacture, we deliver and install buildings, then we lease them to campsites, hotels, also leasing them as garden offices and as uh, beach huts. By lowering the manufacturing cost, by the careful sourcing of materials, and by the use of waste materials, I've managed to get the cost of the building down so we can now get out to the end line user at very affordable lease rates. The buildings are lined, they're insulated, they're double glazed and manufactured for all year round use. Following the growth of the glamour camping business, the Christmas market trade and the number of festivals, there's now a ready market for this product. Any questions? Glenn, can we have a look? Yeah, of course you can. Former police sergeant Glenn Brady believes his new take on the glamping craze is about to make him his fortune. That's not bad. It's pretty solid, isn't it? The Lancashire-based entrepreneur needs a cash injection of a quarter of a million pounds to get his new start-up company off the ground. But the hefty price tag does not seem to have put off Hilary DeVay. Glenn, I'm Hilary. 
Tell us a little bit about how it's made, the cost of making it, the retail price, etc. I own a timber building manufacturer and as part of that business we have a machine that makes log cabins. Right. And as a result of that production process I end up with a lot of waste and scrap wood. So if you look at the way the building's done, it's pretty much done look, all the whole front and back panels from very short offcuts of timber. So these are the, the bits that are left from manufacturing over the log cabins. And uh, basically the production cost would be somewhere between £800 to about £1,500. Right, OK. And have you leased any yet? All the ones that, we, that have been manufactured have been allocated to campsites or to places. And how many is that? We've, we've got about 50 manufactured so far. A good start as Glenn settles easily into den questioning. But leisure industry expert Deborah Meaden knows this market well. So you say you're making these or similar for between 800 and 1500 pounds, yeah. which I think is incredibly good value. So um, can you break that down in terms of um, labour and materials? The, at the moment, we make all the arch sections in a small workshop that I have in Poland. And it's roughly about £750. The floor's about 100 quid, the shingles are about 120 quid, and then there's the labour for putting it up, which was, it brings us to about the £1,000 mark. You're telling me you can make that whole thing there for £1,000? This pounds. whole unit, take everything from the inside, about well, that £1,000. That's amazing, that's fantastic. Yeah. Glenn, £250,000. What are you going to do with a quarter of a million pounds? Well, the, the initial part of the investment would be to upgrade some of the, the production facility we've got, but that would only account for maybe £20,000, £30,000 worth of the investment. The investment would be to build a lot of them quickly for specific events that we know we can lease them out. But the money would pretty much sit in situ if we didn't do that. Right. If we don't lease any, if we don't put any on campsites, your money will stay in the bank and not get touched. Impressive product and a persuasive argument for investment. Glenn is doing well. But what of his other company? Peter Jones wants to know. Glenn. Yeah. Your current business. Yeah. What, what do you do? Manufacturing, timber buildings, sheds, log cabins. It's called Oak and Clough Buildings. What's the machinery. net asset value of the business at the moment? We own the land, the factory. You've got the machinery, the equipment. I would say probably a couple of million pounds. So wh why would you not just do this yourself? The, the motives for the investment are to look at leasing the product or getting this product to market quicker than we ordinarily would do, making two or three each week. OK. So I put a quarter of a million pounds into Newco. Newco spends my quarter of a million pounds with your company your company gets a return on the money invested because I've given you work and also you own 70% of Newco. Well, this, I mean, this... normally people have a bit more of a complicated process so that it's a bit more smoke and mirrors, but you've just gone, no, give me a quarter million quid and give it to my company that I own 100% of. No, I mean, the position that we're at now with this product, it's ready to be taken as totally an autonomous business away well, you can't know because your people are producing all of the stuff that the company needs with my money it's a major setback for Glenn as Peter Jones uncovers a serious flaw in his investment proposition and it looks to have incensed Theo Pafitis Glenn what makes you think that anyone is going to give you a quarter of a million pounds for something that's got hardly any assets in it and all it is is building some sheds. And then if you do get orders for your sheds, the money's going to go to your other company and to Poland. My money's going to disappear. Please, please, give me the answer why you think that's credible. Well, the, the reason why it's credible, for every £1,000 we draw off in investment, we will manufacture a building that we can retail for between five and £7,000, even as garden offices But you can't! Sheds. Because if you could, you'd be making them day and night and smoking a cigar on a Caribbean beach. There's no business model that makes any form of sense except for yourself. I'm out. Thank you. Theo Pafitis delivers a stinging analysis and Glenn's earlier confidence takes a hit. Now, 
will Duncan Bannatyne agree with his rival's concerns? I, I want to take you back to a question Hurry asked you. Yep. She asked you if you'd leased any out yet, and your reply was that you'd allocated the number two. And I don't know what that means. Have you leased any out? No. Have any ever been leased out? We leased about half a dozen last year. OK. Um, I'm out. Hook it up. Yeah. Right, I'm going to let you know where I am, Glenn. It's a little bit insulting to come in here and ask for £250,000 on a separate business without a track record and no basis on which anybody in their right mind would ever consider investing. And you don't look stupid to me. You won't be at all surprised to hear. I won't be investing. I'm out. OK, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Glenn, I think your pitch was outrageous. I think your business model is preposterous. I can't say any more. I just can't say any more. I am out. Short shrift from three dragons and the bewildered entrepreneur's investment dreams look to be all but over. But Peter Jones seems to have something on his mind. Glenn, would you be interested in a conversation about investing in the whole business? Um, to be honest, that w I wouldn't want to go down that, that avenue, really. Why? Um, if, you, if you put 250... Uh, if you, for every £1,000 you invest in these, the end-line product, once we've made them... Is then there's one thing times. about a guy that's been in business for 30 years. You ain't going to be able to diversify my train of thought by giving me some willy story about this. If you've got a business that has an asset value of two million quid, you're asking me to put £250,000 into a company that has no assets. Why would you not entertain a conversation about me coming into the hole? What would you bring to that business that would <laughs> let me... Oh, oh dear, dear me. In terms of... No, I mean, I just... I don't quite know what to say. You really should be coming in pitching the whole business, but you didn't want to do that because you want to keep it for yourself. This is definitely not investable, so I'm out. OK, OK, yeah. thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It was a promising start, but it takes more than that to part these canny dragons from their cash. After my experience in the day, I've got to say, I've had better days in the office. <laughs> I wasn't expected to get quite a, such a severe reaction. I wasn't prepared to give part of my current business up. And by doing that effectively, I put my own nail in my own coffin, but that was fair enough. It was one of those things. And yeah, I'm looking forward to proving them wrong. Hopefully we will come across well to the dragons. It's difficult to know if, if they're gonna like us or loathe us. So, fingers crossed, um, yeah, they'll, they'll like us. Good luck. Good luck. Hello, dragons. My name is Sinead. This is my husband, Adam. We are parents to three young children and co-founders of a company called Schnuggle. We design clever baby products for modern parents. We're here today to ask for your investment of £75,000 in return for a 5% stake of our exciting and growing business. When our first little girl was born, she was quite a sick baby. As new parents, this really focused our attention on the products that were available in the market and the gaps and, and room for improvement. Our first product idea was the modern Moses basket, a very popular product but hadn't been given any attention for a long time. It's made from plastic, so it's wickerless. Um, it's hypoallergenic, easy to clean, and a lot stronger than traditional baskets. Our next product was the Snuggle Bath. So the Snuggle Bath is clever. It's got a bum bump in the bottom that stops the baby sliding under, the large foam backrest, and it really makes it much easier for parents to wash the baby. In just 12 months, the bath sold over 40, excuse me, 45,000 units worldwide. 
Last year, our revenue was over £600,000, with a gross profit of 200. And our three-year forecast is 1.2 this year, 2 next year, and 3.3 million the following year. At the moment, we sell across the UK and Ireland with key accounts such as Amazon, John Lewis, and The White Company. We have just been signed up as suppliers to Mothercare and Tesco's. Thank you so much for your time, and we welcome your questions. Sinead and Adam Murphy from County Down are here to raise £75,000. In return, they'll give away just 5% of their company. Can we have a look at it? Of course you can. Please do. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay, yeah. So, the, one of the unique selling points is that... Oh, it's gone to break it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We do okay. test it for the weight of the, of the baby, <laughs> but yeah. Has it been tested for a, a tooth no, baby? No, don't, don't help me, now, Don't help me. Out. This is like. Oh, Whoa! <laughs> no. no, he's done it. He's done it. He's done it. <laughs> Tuka Suleiman's unconventional product road test has left the entrepreneurs with a patch up job. But Peter Jones has a problem he's not sure is quite so rectifiable. So, Adam, Sinead. Yes. Have you gone out on a limb with the, va with the valuation? We don't think we have. No. Because you've come in and you've clearly valued your business at one and a half million pounds... Yep. ..the traffic light and the alarm's going off in my head. And I'm pretty sure you said that you had only turned over 600,000 last year, making a... Gross margin of 200. That's correct. Yeah. What was your net profit? Net profit was 22,000. So you, you have a business that made 22,000 pounds last year that you believe is worth 1.5 million today. And our forecast this year that we're already starting to work towards 1.2 million, and we should have a net profit of 120,000 this year. What's your run rate in the last quarter? I would say it's in the region of 350, maybe, in the last three months. And what profit has that brought into the business? Three and a half percent. So you've made £9,000 in the last quarter? Correct, yeah. So you're not on the run rate of 120 yet, then? No, the way that um, we've really built that forecast is the new products, which are coming in very soon. Right. I, I'm struggling to get past uh, in fact, getting to the point where you get annoyed about this valuation. Because your business is very clearly, at this stage, not worth the money that you're suggesting. And every time I think, well, actually, I can change that, but I can't really, because you've come in with the most ludicrous, ridiculous, stupid valuation. Peter Jones is not impressed with the entrepreneur's financial appraisal of their business. Now, Nick Jenkins wants to know if Sinead and Adam have the credentials to back up that price tag. I wouldn't have a problem so much with that if one of you had said, for example, I spent 20 years in mother care, um, I was commercial director, I know exactly what this market is. I I'd think, OK, what are all the elements that are going to make this work? But it's your chance of getting there. Maybe we should tell you a little bit more about some of the other things that are giving us our confidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of the US market, we are just about to become suppliers with um, Bye Bye Baby and Babies R Us. Um, we have also produced uh, the bath in a white label for uh, Durrell, which are one of the largest baby brands in the world, just for Brazil. The first big distributor that we've worked with is in China, and now they're, they're looking at taking a sort of 40-foot container from us every month. Not my game. Really, is not bad going at all. A timely revelation of some potentially lucrative international business deals silence a sceptical Nick Jenkins. Will global business giant Tuka Suleiman give Schnuggles export plans his seal of approval? I think you've done great because you've looked at the international market. There are 800, 900,000 babies a year in the UK? Yep. Roughly. Um, there are a lot more in China. Yes. A lot more in the States. I've, I've just come back from the States, and I think it's a massive market. And the fact that you are thinking international yeah. makes the proposition a lot 
I think more viable. Um, I just happen to be in that little sector at the moment. Uh, just going to get my head around the valuation. To Kasuliman, hints at investment, but isn't yet showing Sinead and Adam the colour of his money. As he continues to weigh up the investment proposition, millionaire mum of four, Sarah Willingham, is weighing up their USP. There are so many products out there. I mean, there really are. And to be honest, they all do the same thing. The question is, is can you develop a brand? And that's very expensive and really hard work. And I think that's going to take a lot more than 75 grand. What we're finding, uh, which has helped, is, is people are, are kind of getting on board with the story of us and how we started the company and, and the fact that we have our own children and that's inspired the design of the products. Why is it such a unique story? Sorry, I'm missing it, this. I, I, I'm missing that as well. I mean, why is this a unique story? No, it, well, it's not necessarily a unique story, but we found that a lot of the customers who are buying from us, they just love what Snuggle is about. But and they, they love the fact that somebody that's already had a child invented it. Yes, and they... But, but, that's the bit we, I think, I don't know, both struggling with that one. I mean, <laughs> you're not unique in that. I, I was, I, honestly, I was out there in the street the other day. There were loads of children out there. You are not the only people. It doesn't look like Peter Jones or Nick Jenkins are buying parenthood as a USP. And now Deborah Meaden thinks the fledgling entrepreneurs have made a schoolboy error. I don't think your branding's strong at all. If you look at that, I think you've got three brands on there. You've got Dreamy, yeah. you've got Bumgo, and you've got Pebbly. Yeah. What you haven't got is Snuggle. Yeah. I'd think that was a Dreamy. That is so true. I hadn't even thought I would that. have no idea so that's a Snuggie. Um, do you know what my overriding thing is? And it's a personal thing, not... It's... I don't even have children. I have to feel something, you know? Sure. I, I just I just think, yeah, of course I could do it as a job, yep. but I don't feel it, okay. because it, I, it's just not... So, um, you know, for, for, for totally personal reasons. I'm really sorry, but I won't be investing. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks. Deborah Meaden struggles to bond with Schnuggle, becoming the first dragon to go out. Could Sarah Willingham be feeling a little more positive What you've produced is aesthetically really pleasing. You know, it's a nice product, and I like the idea of the Moses basket. I think it's good. But you can't patent a plastic Moses basket. And if you go out there and you effectively educate people that a plastic Moses basket is the way forward, because wicker can be really difficult to clean certain things. Yes. Um, how easy is it going to be for somebody else to come out with that? So you've got to be there with your brand, and that's where I think you're going to struggle. So I'm going to say I'm not going to invest, so I'm really sorry, but I'm out. Thank you. Thank you. I think you've done a cracking job of getting the business to where it is today. My concern is about the, uh, the, the probability of getting to this position of selling three million a year. You, you may well. But the probability of you getting to that three million isn't enough to take me um, over the line at this valuation. But I really do hope you get there. Thank um, you. Thank you. Out. Appreciate it. Thank you. Nick Jenkins decides the investment isn't a safe enough bet for him. Has Peter Jones heard anything to persuade him the business is worthy of that seven-figure price tag? I'm still miffed. Um, I don't think that you will get an investment from anybody at 1.5 million for your business. But you have done a great job to launch a company, and it's wonderful to see. But you, you, you leave me no room, because there's no question, I'm, even if I was really interested, I, <laughs> you're not going to give the, the equity away. I know that already. On that basis, I can't invest, so I'm out.
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. That valuation takes Peter Jones out of the investment equation. But will the dragon that broke the product earlier be prepared to broker a deal now? Look, I think, I, I, I just said, I like the product. I like what you've done. And, and I like the fact that you're taking traditional product and, and you're, you're modernizing it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think I can add a lot of value to this. I'm going to make you an offer. Your valuation's out. You want 75,000 for 5%. Well, I'm going to give you 100,000. OK. But I want 30% of the business. Because I believe that I can take you to the next level a lot quicker, especially in America. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you more than you're asking for. Sure. Because uh, I think you're going to need it. And uh, when I get my money back, I will give back 15%. So... Could we have a little chat? Sure. Thank you. Tuka Suleiman is offering £25,000 more cash than the 75 the entrepreneurs were hoping for. But in exchange, he's asking for 30% of the equity, way above the 5% they were looking to give away, and slashing the valuation of their business from 1.5 million to 330,000 pounds. Firstly, thank you very much for the offer, but we can't go that high. We have a counter which is we will give up 15%. And then if we hit the targets in the, the coming year that we said, the 1.2 million, we'd like to buy back five, which would leave you with 10. Is that something that would work? We would love to have you on board. We really yeah. would. <laughs> I'd reduce down to 25 and then want to get my money back down to 15 because then it gives me uh, enough to focus on to make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think yeah, I'm giving you more money than you're asking for. Mm -hmm. I am. Um, I'm happy. You happy to? Mm -hmm. We'd be happy to do that. Great. Fantastic. <laughs> well done. Right. Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Well done. I'm looking forward to it, thank you. No, no. And you're not allowed to get into any more Moses masks. No, 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 no. Please do it. No, I, I, I think in the US it's all going up fantastic. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the way to do it. Sinead and Adam may well have given away more equity than they'd hoped, but they now have £25,000 more cash than they came in for and a successfully negotiated ratchet agreement with a global tycoon. Tuka, you could end up now, after that demonstration, with a new nickname. The baby dragon. The baby dragon. Well done. Well Thank done. you. Really great, mate. Well, well done. done. Go Thank you. <laughs> I don't think that working with Tuca is ever going to be dull. <laughs> I have no idea what to expect from uh, yeah our future meetings with him, but I can't wait. London-based Dan Edwards is next in the den tonight with a pioneering exercise regime that's scaling the heights of ambition. Our business is building better humans. It's just a tool to train body and mind through movement. For us, it's way more than a business, and it's always going to be. It's, it's just our way of life now.
be a massive applause. <laughs> I just hope you don't ask us to do that. Oh, I wanted to go. <laughs> I do that every morning. <laughs> Great. Um, hi, my name's Dan Edwards. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Parkour Generations. We're living in a world that is desperately in need of more movement. The information age has given rise to very sedentary and immobile lifestyles, and that's had people out looking for refreshing new ways to get fit, get active, get mobile, and to engage with their body and mind and connect with their environment. Parkour is a way of training the body and mind through movement, including movements like running, jumping, climbing, crawling, vaulting. Earlier this year, parkour was recognised as a new sport in the UK, which is the first country ever to do so. We provide services such as teaching, classes, workshops, events. We also provide for movies, performance, live display, product launch. We already have early stage agreements with one of the largest gym chains in the States, one of the most exclusive ones in the UK, to launch our parkour programmes this summer and this autumn. We're looking for £150,000 for 5% of the company, and we'd love to know if any of you guys would like to have a go. Why not? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Great. A sure-footed pitch from Dan Edwards, who's offering 5% of his movement training classes in return for £150,000. So I'm going to come. Yeah. Oh, pop up. That's it. I'm going to yeah. go over. Exactly. And I pop, and pop up. down. Beautiful. Isn't that what they do at the end? <laughs> <laughs> the next obstacle for the entrepreneur is the dragon's questioning. That's it. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautifully done. Starting with leisure industry insider and movie fan, Deborah Meaden. Dan, I thought that was fun. <laughs> um, so you do that really cool stuff over the roofs and over the... Yeah. Do you do that? Yes, yes. And what films have you done? Most recent productions we worked with were Spider-Man, oh. Assassin's Creed, Patient Zero. So I guess, for me, the most important question is, could you get me a part in one of those movies yeah. doing Absolutely. parkour? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, training. right. Okay, training. you're right. <laughs> All right, now get serious. Um, you're obviously trading. You're doing a lot of work. So what's the turnover? Last year was 424,000, and the year before that, I think, it was 357. The year before that was 312. And um, profit? Profit last year was 64,000 profit. The year before that was 28. And the year before that, we actually made a loss of about 50,000. I think we're building a facility in London, the, the gym. How big do you see this going? We see it fairly big. For example, in the fitness industry, what we want to do is license our content. For example, uh, a gym chain in the States might have 500 clubs, and the idea is they pay a license fee per club per year. Um, to have your brand and your content in there, and you train their instructors, and then they deliver the classes. If you're above a certain age, say, I'm 40 plus, how easy is it to learn some of these things? Because you guys were doing somersaults and flips, and presumably that's quite hard to do. What you see there is a little bit of the high-end stuff, um, but it's, it's absolutely accessible to everyone. But the vast majority of parkour training is just refining your movement skills. And what's been the reaction with gyms in the UK that you've approached already for licensing something like this? Most of them are very, very, very interested. Which and ones have you met and what have they said? We've met pretty much a lot of the big ones, the Fitness First and the Virgins and the David Lloyds, and, and they definitely want to engage with it, but we haven't really found one that's exactly the right fit. But how do you mean the right fit? Because presumably all of them should be really interested in something which is new and exciting. Yes, but there's certain things that we want in place. So we're very interested in making sure that it retains its movement quality. Um, so off the big chains, have any of them shown real interest? Yes. How many? Two to three were, were very, very interested. And we are still in negotiations with some of them. Tej Lalvani has uncovered potential interest, but no take up from big industry players which has left Peter Jones questioning the company's seven-figure price tag. I was hoping that you would come in and say, well, I've signed three gyms, we're doing a rollout, that's why we need 150,000, and we've already got all of these signed up and here are the deals, but you're not. Why have you come in with such a ludicrous valuation? We are rolling out in the summer with the second largest gym chain in the States, so they will be piloting the programs there, then they will roll out to their 450 clubs. So that is going ahead. And in the UK in the autumn, we're going to be rolling it out in London with a very exclusive gym. One gym? Yeah. It's a very high-end gym, let's say, a very expensive gym to be a member of. Yeah, but it's kind of like you've, you want to build a fire, and you've, at the moment you've collated some wood, but you don't have the ability to light the fire. 
you have no contracts in place, and you're valuing this at three million, which is a bit annoying. I can completely understand how you might look at it that way. It's been recognised as a sport in the UK. That's a huge thing. So this is the amount of work we've done to create this industry and ring fence our products and our content and our brand. Well, that's the point, you haven't done that. You have not done that at all. Tell me about the agreements that you've got in the UK with one gym. Not a gym where it's an exclusive gym. I want to know the big gyms. So, do you know Kix? So Kix is the most expensive. I'm a expensive. member of Kix. Yeah, great, awesome. If I go on Saturday and say, what activity have you got in your gym? They'll mention you, will they? They might keep it secret. <laughs> they won't keep it secret because they know me very well, though. But, but yes, we're piloting the course. Have you September. signed up the agreement? Uh, well, is it signed? No, we haven't signed the agreement. Uh, uh, so you haven't signed? No, okay. no. Okay, fine. We're, we're, so you, you've answered my question, yeah, yeah. right? You've not signed. Yeah. I get the impression that you're dreaming. So all I can say to you is keep on dreaming. It's not going to be with my money, and I'm out. A sceptical Tuka Suleiman is the first dragon out, unconvinced by Dan's claims of impressive growth on the horizon. But Jenny Campbell, queen of the business flip, is more concerned about the company's financial structure. You've used we a lot. Who owns this business? There's three um, co-founders, so there's three shareholders. So you're, the equity is 33 and a third each, yep. is it? And, and what money has gone into the business already? There's no money has gone into it from any loans or anything like that. None of you have invested any money in this. You've just lived on what it's generated. Yeah. So have you heard of the phrase in business, having your own skin in the game? Yes. You've got no money in this business yourself. You've put nothing in. I suppose we didn't have the cash to put in. An investor will always want to see some level of investment from yourselves. We have entrepreneurs in the den here who've mortgaged their houses, sold their houses. Can I speak on taken... my behalf? Because actually, I don't always want to see money in the business. Speak on your behalf. Some investors will want to see that. Yep. Yeah. You have to put yourself in an investor's shoes and say, what's an investor going to look for? And they need to see a credible entrepreneur, a credible product, something that will give them a rate of return. And it's impossible to see a rate of return on this for this level of investment, for the level of equity that you're offering. It's really quite difficult. There's nothing concrete there at the moment to hold on to. So the first newly recognised sport in 30 years okay. in the country, that's a, that's Look, a big thing. I do recognise your passion and enthusiasm for this. I don't recognise the business opportunity at all. I'm out. Jenny Campbell doesn't see a viable proposition and is the second dragon down. Will Deborah Meaden, who already has a foothold in gym-based exercise classes, take a leap of faith and invest in this one. So, Dan, I think it's really cool what you've done. I think it's fantastic that you've got this recognised as a sport. But the first two words I wrote down are class size. How many people can you get into a class? We run classes regularly that have up to 70 people in a class, depending on the space. So in a small space, so for example in here, we'd probably have a max of 40 people in the class. Now, I get that, but the point about class size is gyms are looking to attract more people yep. into those rooms. And every time you put a piece of kit in, it knocks a body out. And it's the size of the movement that we were doing there. You need space to do this that you don't need when you're standing next door to each other and moving. But also, it is going to be restricted to a certain type of person. So it worries me that your market's getting smaller and smaller. So I won't be investing. I'm out. Thanks. Dan, I think you've been really disingenuous coming in here with a valuation of three million and incredibly disappointing. You've made it absolutely clear that you don't want investment because you're valuing your business at 50 times its earnings, which is ludicrous. So on that basis, I'm out. As Peter Jones rejects the deal, irritated by the valuation, only fitness fan Tej Lalvani is still in play. Can Dan persuade the last dragon standing that his training system does have legs? I actually love what you're doing. You know, I've always loved climbing as a kid. The only thing I'm struggling with is, 
is the reception that you've got from some of the chains. I mean, they should have adopted it and taken it and signed up. And I think you're probably going to have a lot of difficulty. My advice is to continue with the one gym that you're, you're building, make that a success, fill it up, and then move on to another location. And you just own the franchises and build it up. But even as a, as a punt, the equity split three ways between you. And if I wanted 40%, I'm going to be the major shareholder. And that just doesn't work. It needs to be you guys driving the business forward. It's not a feasible investment, so I'm out. Thank you very much. Cheers. So Dan vaults away without a dragon investor, unable to avoid the perhaps inevitable fate of those who overprice their startup in the den. Just valuations, people based valuations, it's, ah. it's a real problem. It just gets in the way of a proper conversation, doesn't it? I'm pretty sure we are going to get investment at the valuation we want. We will go on from here and prove the dragons wrong. Hello, uh, my name is Matt King and I'm the inventor of WeQ for You. And I'm pitching today for £150,000 investment in return for a 1% equity stake for my established profitable business. Matt, sorry to interrupt you, but did I get it right? You said 150000 for 1%? Uh, that's right, yes. My company specialises in helping people get through to busy call centres without having to wait on hold. And I'm going to show you how we do that with one of our products, the WeQ for You app. To use it, you just open the app, enter the number you wish to reach, and hit Start Call. Remember, if you get stuck in a queue, just press number 9 star and WeQ for you. So now we're being put through to the call centre. Okay, so now we're stuck in a queue. We just press nine star. Okay, now we can end the call. There we go. And now we're waiting in the queue, but your phone's no longer connected to the call. Rather, we're queuing for you. And we'll be reconnected automatically when the agent answers. It's a real no-brainer for anybody to use. Now, the WeQ for You app is not what we sell. What we sell is the business product that we sell to call centers. And that's actually the main focus of our business because it generates substantial ongoing revenue streams for us. And we already have several high street brand name customers. And last year we sold over a million minutes of WeQ for You for business to UK call centers alone. Um, so what you're saying is you valued a company at 15 million pound that turned over 300,000 with a net profit of 40,000. Yes. How have you arrived at that valuation? Well, we're looking at the size of the market, really. Uh, according to the Department of Trade and Industry, uh, the UK market's worth 300 million he pounds can't. alone. God, are you for real? Mm -hmm. Matt, can you explain to me how the Department of Trade and Industry evaluated uh, the market for people who want to buy an app Sure. So uh, there was a recent study by the Department of Trade and Industry that found there were 6,200 call centres in the UK with 10 or more staff uh, uh, taking or making calls. 66% of those are inbound positions and the average agent salary is £15,000 a year. Uh, the average reported answer rate at the call centres is 95%. So if you multiply I don't that all together... I that's got to do with my question. I'm, I am answering your question. I'm just explaining how I get there. Today? Yes. Uh, so, uh, if you multiply all that, that means that the current spending on answering inbound calls is £13.7 billion a year. So that means that the 5% of abandoned calls, by the same logic, are worth at least £700 million a year in the UK. Matt, this is a complete wind-up, and actually, wind up. why are you here? This is not a wind-up. No, you of course are. it is. You're, you're not, listen, you're a sensible guy, you're not delusional, you're trying to have a bit of fun. Um, the fun is about to backfire very seriously, and you're about to go up those stairs faster than you came in. I have to tell you, this is disappointing. Okay. You are smart, you've got a product that works. If you'd come in here with a sensible valuation, asking for a sensible sum of money, I'll bet you I'd have invested in you. Right. But I'm sorry. What happens to the call centres that say, all our operators are busy at the moment, they've actually clocked your number, one, two, three, four, yes. five, six, oh, seven, we, eight, we nine, ten. Really bad idea. We will return your call within one hour. Okay, What's so wrong with that? You ha when you're making one of these callbacks, you're actually taking an agent off make taking those inbound calls. So let's say you've got 10 agents, somebody requests a callback, 
in the next cycle you've got nine agents taking no, inbound calls. No, it's automated. And one, and one person making outbound calls. So now your inbound queue is getting longer because you have fewer agents making, uh, taking the inbound calls. Mm -hmm. So pretty soon you yeah. find you have eight, yeah. seven, six, have five agents. Have you ever run a And uh, you, pretty soon you find you're an outbound call centre. Did anybody ever tell you that God gave you two of these and one of those? Uh, I believe that's the first time. Well, I'm telling you now. And also, please use them wisely. Okay. So would you like me to finish explaining what the problem is with that Not system? Not really, no. Okay. There are systems out there that will log your number, log your call, and a, an operator will return Well, the your feedback call. that we've and had they from are companies automated, that have used that system... Not only are they automated... Will you shut up? All right, well, thank you for taking the time to almost listen to me today. <laughs>